When the 7th Cavalry was stationed at Fort Lincoln in North Dakota, one of its corporals, John Noonan, married a woman who had been Custer's longtime laundress. The laundress was named Mrs. Nash. From her first marriage, she was a Mexican who had been married to two troopers previously, and both had deserted, and both ran off with her money. A laundress made a lot more money than a regular soldier. She traveled with the regiment and was a valuable member, as she also performed midwifery and was a renowned baker. Libby Custer said of Mrs. Nash, When she first came to our regiment, she was married to a trooper, who, to all appearances, was good to her. My first knowledge of her was in Kentucky. She was our laundress, and when she brought the linen home, it was fluted and frilled so daintily that I considered her a treasure. The woman was a Mexican, and like the rest of that hairy tribe, she had so coarse and stubborn a beard that her chin had a blue look after shaving, in marked contrast to her swarthy face. She was tall, angular, awkward, and seemingly coarse, but I knew her to be tender-hearted. John Noonan and his wife had been happily married for five years, until one day he came back from a scouting expedition to find his wife had died of an ailment. On her deathbed, Mrs. Noonan had asked for a chaplain and begged that her body be buried directly and not bathed and prepared for burial. The ladies of the post did not heed her request. As the ladies in the fort prepared Mrs. Nash for burial, they discovered a shocking fact. Mrs. Nash was a man. The surprise revelations swept the post. It soon became gossip that traveled fast. A dispatch from Bismarck, Dakota Territory, informed the world. A singular development transpired at Fort Lincoln today. Mrs. Sergeant Noonan, who died last night, turns out to be a man. There is no explanation of the unnatural union, except that the supposed Mexican woman was worth $10,000 and was able to buy her husband's silence. She has been with the 7th Cavalry nine years. The Bismarck Tribune newspaper said in their report, Mrs. Nash has testicles as big as a bull. The accuracy of these stories was confirmed by the official report of post-surgeon W.D. Wolverton, who found the body to be that of a fully developed male in all that makes the difference in sex, without any abnormal condition that would cause a doubt on the subject. When Noonan got back from his patrol, he found that his wife was dead and he had become the object of ridicule. Corporal Noonan protested he knew nothing of her true sex and even told comrades that they had been trying to have a baby. The whole story was becoming an embarrassment for the regiment and Corporal Noonan. Commanding Officer Sturgis wrote on November 23, 1878, that if there is any law by which this man could be sent to the penitentiary, I would respectfully suggest that it be called into requisition in his case. Military brass concurred and Sturgis was instructed to bring the case to attention of the U.S. District Attorney. But before that could happen, Noonan worked his service revolver and suffered extreme lead poisoning. He died in the company stables at the age of 30, on November 30, 1878. His death was noted by a local newspaper to have relieved the regiment of the odium which the man's presence had cast them. Years earlier, First Lieutenant Edward Godfrey noted in 1868 that Mrs. Nash was tall and angular and had a coarse voice, and that one day, a stiff breeze whisked the veil off her face and revealed a bearded chin. Godfrey never told of his observations, and he only mentioned it once the story had been shared. In the spring of the year, somewhere early in the 1850s, a party of five left the mining camp of Coloma for the purpose of hunting deer for the market in the locality of Mosquito Canyon. On the morning of the second day in camp, the party separated, each going his own way to hunt, 
and at night it was found that one of their members named Broadus failed to appear. The others started out in different directions to search for him the next morning, and after a day spent in fruitless searching, they returned to camp only to find that another of their number, named William Jabin, was this night missing. After an anxious night, chiefly spent in discussing the probable fate of their missing companions, the remaining three started out on the trail of Jabin, he having told them the previous morning what part of the country he was going to travel. Slowly following his tracks left in the soft soil and broken down herbage, they found him about noon, terribly mangled and unconscious, but alive. The flesh on his face was torn and lacerated in a frightful manner, and he was otherwise injured in his chest and body. Further search revealed, nearby, the dead body of their other missing comrade, seated on a boulder by the side of a small stream with his head on his folded arms, which were supported by a shelf of rock in front of him. His whole underjaw had been bitten off and torn away, and a large pool of clotted blood at his feet showed that he had slowly bled to death after having been attacked and wounded by a bear. The ground showed evidences of a fearful struggle, being torn up and liberally sprinkled with blood for yards around. The men carried Jabin to the nearest mining camp, whence others went to bring in the body of Broadus. Jabin finally recovered but he was shockingly disfigured for life. He afterwards told how he came upon the tracks of Broadus, and on reaching the spot where Broadus had received his death wound, he was suddenly attacked by a huge she-bear that was followed by two small cubs. The bear had evidently been severely wounded by Broadus and was in a terrible rage. She seized Jabin before he could turn to flee, and falling with her whole weight upon his body and chest, began biting his face. He soon lost consciousness from the pressure upon his chest and remembered no more. The poor fellow became a misanthrope, someone who shunned society and others, owing to his terrible disfigurement, and was finally found drowned in the river near Coloma. Alan Kelly, 